Hello and welcome to iBiology. My name's Andrew Philby. I'm the director of the Flow Cytometry Core Facility at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. Today I'd like to tell you about a very powerful analytical single cell technology called imaging flow cytometry. In this presentation, I'd like to cover the following subjects. I'd like to begin by giving an intro to cytometry and cytometers. I'd then like to move on to talk specifically about what imaging flow cytometry is, why we might choose this as a technology to measure our cells, what kind of data we get out of it, so particularly what we can derive from a digital image. I'd then like to give a few examples of some data analysis and then finish with a little bit about the future of imaging flow cytometry and a summary. Okay, so let's begin with the word cytometry. The word cytometry is made from two words. The first word is the Greek word kytos, which means hollow basket. In this case, we're using it to refer to the word cell. The other half of the word comes from another Greek word, which is metria, which means the process of measurement. So we can broadly define cytometry as the process of cell measurement. But to expand on this definition more, I would say that cytometry is very much the measurement of phenotype of cells, always done at the single cell level, but it's always conducted on a population scale. This means that we're not just looking at a few cells, we're always trying to measure as many as possible. And the reason we do this, of course, is because every biological system, no matter what, is heterogeneous. And cytometry allows us to measure and decode this heterogeneity, heterogeneity. So in this cartoon, very simply put, we take our cell biology, we perform cytometry, and we generate hopefully a set of meaningful numbers from it. And with these numbers, we may ask these following questions. So for example, we may ask what type of cells there are within our sample and how many there are of each phenotype. We may want to know what they do functionally. And then we may want to put this into some kind of context, so particularly uh, human development or human disease. So again, in this cartoon, I just want to reiterate this point. Cytometry is very much the measurement of everything single cell. So within this cartoon here, we can see that using cytometry, we can measure the whole flow of information right through the single cell, from looking at receptor expression, to the binding of a ligand, to measuring signaling cascades, looking at phosphorylation, we can look at DNA modification. We can also look at RNA transcription. And then finally, we can also look again at things like post-translational modification. And again, the important thing to say about cytometry is that we're taking our unknown cell population, we're potentially labeling them with something, and we're able to then ask all these different questions and finally put this back into the context of the wider population. So cytometry itself is very much kind of formed on three different pillars, three different principles. So the first pillar, or the first principle of cytometry, is that whatever we do, we need to take our measurements in a very controlled fashion. The next thing as well, if possible, is that cytometry should be at minimum semi-quantitative. Then if we follow this controlled and quantitative approach, we can then say that our measurements are comparable. And what I mean by that is that for every cell that we measure within a sample, we can make a fair measurement comparison between them. We can even make measurements across samples, and hopefully we can even make comparisons, fair comparisons between samples across experiments done on different days. All of this, of course, is built on a foundation that cytometry is often multi-parameter, meaning that we're not just looking again at one cell and one measurement, we're looking at lots of measurements on lots of cells. And in order to give the scalability, cytometry also tends to be very high throughput in nature so that we can sample as many cells as possible, as quickly as possible. Okay, so in order to do our cytometry, we need to have a specialized system, a measurement device we call a cytometer. So what I'm showing here is just a very quick uh, output from doing a Google image search on the word cytometer. And all I really want to make a point on this slide is that there are many different types of cytometers and many, many different ways of doing cytometry, but of course they still follow the three principles I've just introduced. So again, just to reiterate this point, is that a cytometer is an instrument, a specialized instrument which generates and measures signals from single cells, often in a high throughput manner, using semi-quantitative measurement me capabilities, and often in a multi-parameter fashion, which again, forms the foundation of these three pillars of our cytometry. So to be a little bit more specific for the purpose of this presentation, I want to introduce five different cytometry systems to you. So I'm gonna start right at the far end here, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about conventional flow cytometry. This is fluorescence-based. Then we have mass-based cytometry, also flow-based. Then we also have 
flow cytometry done with a genomic measurement, a genomic endpoint, often looking at DNA and RNA within the cells. And then very much the focus of this presentation, we have imaging flow cytometry and then another technology called imaging mass cytometry. Now, the way we can kind of rank these different technologies is firstly, we can rank them by the number of parameters that they're able to measure on each individual cell. So typically speaking, conventional fluorescence-based flow cytometry counts as kind of the low parameter space. As we move up in this direction, though, to mass-based cytometry, we can make more measurements per cell. And at this stage, I'd like to refer you to another talk in the eye biology cytometry series by Dr. Suzanne Heck on this subject. If we move up to this particular system here, we can look at RNA within our cells. And again, we move the parameter space up and increase the number of measurements we can make per cell. When we then work into the area where we're actually looking at images of cells now, we increase the parameter space infinite, infinitely almost. And particularly when we're looking at tissue imaging as well. But the trade-off here is as we increase the number of parameters, unfortunately, we do tend to then concomitantly reduce the throughput. So what this means is, is that we're not as able to make as many measurements on as many cells as possible. So we can also subdivide these systems into two different classes. These three systems tend to be described as zero resolution systems. And what this means is that we are not deriving any kind of imaging information from the cells we're measuring. These two cytometers though are image based and will give us images of the cells that we're looking at. And again, particularly for this talk, this will be the focus of my, my talk. Okay, so let's go back to our definitions here. Here we have the word cytometry again. We've already defined this as the process of cell measurement. What happens now if I put the word flow in front of it? Well, to define the word flow, we know that this defines as moving along in a stream. So this straight away gives us a clue about how we're making our cell measurement. So what we're doing in flow cytometry is we're making all our cell or particle measurements in a liquid suspension. So this is very easy for samples that are derived from liquid biopsies, things like uh, blood or, or liquor, or even uh, suspension cell lines. But as you can imagine, if you're working with tissue, you have to then firstly be able to disaggregate the tissue down into a single cell suspension. Okay, so what I want to do very briefly is give a very quick overview of what we call conventional fluorescence-based flow cytometry. And again, at this stage, I'd like to refer you to another eye biology series cytometry talk by Malta Paulson on this subject. So what we have here in a conventional flow cytometer, we, we tend to have a laser. We tend to have some kind of optical setup where we have some mirrors. And then we have some kind of detector. In this case, it's a photomultiplier tube, a detector that is not spatially registered. So over here, we have our cell. We introduce some kind of targeted fluorescence to our cells. So in this case, I'm using an example of some antibodies, each one binding a different surface receptor, each one with a different fluorescence color on the back of it. So now, as we flow these cells through the laser beam, as they make contact with the laser, these fluorochromes become excited. They emit photons at their given wavelength. This light then hits a series of mirrors. And each mirror then is responsible for subdividing the light up into different wavelengths of light. And this hits our detector. So what do we get from the detector? What we get from the detector is this. It's a pulse profile. So what we're seeing here is that as the cell enters the laser beam, we start to see a measurement of signal appearing. As the cell then moves through the laser beam, we find the pulse forming. And then as the cell exits the laser beam, our pulse profile completes. Now, we're able to measure three parameters from this pulse profile. We can measure the area under the pulse curve, we can measure the height of the pulse, and we can also measure the width. And I'll talk a little bit about those on the next slide. But let's go back to our cells. Let's think about this now. So cells have structure. Cells have morphology. When we add fluorescent signals to our cells, those signals are located somewhere within or outside of the cell. The problem we have is that when we use conventional flow cytometry, we lose all that spatial resolution. So literally, all this lovely cell biology and structure is collapsed down into this pulse profile, where, again, we can derive the area under the curve, which gives us the measure of total integrated fluorescence as that cell's gone through that laser beam. We can also look at the height, which is the maximum signal, and we can also measure the width, which gives us an idea of the time of flight of the cell or particle through the laser beam. But the important thing to say is that we have lost all that spatial resolution. 
So as I said, for every single cell then that goes through a conventional fluorescence-based flow cytometer, we have an, a cell ID or an event ID. And then for each measurement we make of the pulse curve, the area on the pulse curve, this is what the A refers to, we have a numerical value, a single value. So again, all that morphology, cell shape, structure is collapsed down into one value. And then what we do when we look at the data is we take these values and we plot them against different parameters. In this example, it's a, a scatter graph. And this is some real data. This is some real conventional flow cytometry data. And we can see that we have different cell events appearing in this biaxial plot. And of course, we can get a lot of information. We know a little bit about the cells and we can derive some measurements here. So in this example, just using two parameters, forward scattered light and side scattered light, we can get a very good idea about where our lymphocytes would be, where our monocytes would be, and finally where our granulocytes would be that have a very, very high scatter value. But again, as I keep stressing to you, we've lost all the morphology of our cells. So what are we missing? In this example here, what I'm showing you are two samples, two cell samples. This is a cell line which has been engineered to express a fluorescently tagged nuclear transcription factor. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at the data as though we would look at it on a conventional flow cytometer. So we have no spatial information. We're just looking at the total integrated fluorescent signal. And of course, what we can do here is we can say, well, of my unstimulated population and my stimulated population, what is the level of fluorescence of this transcription factor? And we can report this using something called the median fluorescence intensity of the GFP signal. And hopefully you can see from these data that we don't really have a lot of difference. So we'd be disappointed, we'd be confused. We wouldn't see any difference really between an unstimulated cell population and a stimulated cell population. But what if we have the imagery? So let me show you this. This is actually data from an imaging flow cytometry experiment. Now, when we're able to look at our signals here, we can see two very different morphological states. In the unstimulated sample, we can see that our GFP against our nuclear stain, it is not translocated. The two signals are separate from one another, telling us the cells are in an unstimulated state. When we add our stimulus though, when we activate them, we can see that while the overall fluorescence barely changes, the spatial localization of the two signals are very different. Now we start to see our GFP tagged MFAT transcription factor moving into the nucleus of our cell. So the point here to make is that in many situations in cell biology, the location and the spatial context is essential to the underlying biological question. Okay, so let's now begin to talk a little bit specifically about the technique of imaging flow cytometry. And at this stage, I just wanna make a point here that at the time of recording this seminar, the only commercially available imaging flow cytometer is from a company uh, that was originally called Amnis, who developed a system called the ImageStream X. This is now uh, owned by the Luminex Corporation. So let's take a little step back again before we get into this. I want to provide another definition to you about what imaging cytometry is. So again, it's very much related to our definition of what cytometry or flow cytometry is. So again, it's the measurement of our phenotype at a single cell level. Again, we've got scale and throughput. So we're looking at a population level. We're not looking at just one cell. We're looking at as many as possible. But the important thing to hear say now is that the single cell level data is going to be mathematically derived from a digital image. So again, we're taking our cell biology and we're converting it into a set of numbers. But now the numbers are advanced because we're not just looking at a total integrated signal, we're looking at morphology and spatial context as well. So I want to just quickly go over um, the optical setup of the uh, Amnish image, Amnish image Stream system to try and give some uh, overview about how the system works and how it takes the images. So here is a, a schematic diagram. For those of you who are familiar with conventional flow cytometers, you will see a number of familiar features. I will point those out and I will also point out some of the differences. So let's begin down here. So as I said, it's a flow cytometer. Therefore, we're looking at our cells in a liquid suspension phase. We will be adding antibodies with fluorescent tags against different markers of interest, um, and we will be flowing them through the system. So as you'd expect to find, you have a flow cell, and this is kind of where the magic happens. This is where the measurement occurs. In the flow cell, the cells or particles are ordered nicely to then go through the excitation lasers. So again, you can see very similar kind of excitation lasers as you would see in conventional flow cytometers. But then this is where it gets different. 
What we have is we also have LEDs that produce transmitted light. So we have a bright field image of ourselves. This is very, very beneficial because unlike things like forward scatter, it will give a good correlation and good idea about the size of your cell. And then after the flow cell, when the cells travel through and get excited and also um, um, exposed to transmitted light as well, we have a numerical aperture, so a, a, a magnification basically. And the system has the ability to change the magnification from 20 to 40 to 60x. So now all the lights and information that we've produced as the cells go through this area here is passed on to another area that would be quite familiar to conventional flow cytometrists. We have here a stack of filters. Now, just like the mirrors I showed you in the cartoon on the slide previously, these mirrors are here to chop the light up that we've been produced here through our excitation into the different emission wavelengths that then correlate to the different dyes and the different markers that we're looking at on ourselves. Now, these mirrors are angled in such a way as to focus light of a particular wavelength onto the detector. So in this case, the detector is a CCD camera. And this CCD camera obviously is what gives us the spatial registered output, unlike the PMT in the conventional systems. And this is what we get. So here we can see for each channel, we have a set of spectrally decomposed, spatially registered images being projected. Now, on the more advanced systems, it operates with two cameras working simultaneously. This then allows us to get up to 12 images per cell in a high throughput manner. So how does this work? It's very challenging when you think about it. We're able to image a very fast moving object. We want to have a blur free object and we want to get as much sensitivity and measurement from that object as we can. So the way that the system I've described works is using a process we call time delay integration or TDI. And in this cartoon, I'm gonna to endeavor to try and explain how that works to you. So these are the components of the cartoon here. Over here, we have our excitation laser. We have our uh, flow cell. Here we have our mirrors, our spectral decomposition element. And then over on this part here, we just have an example of just three channels from the CCD camera. Here we have our cell of interest. Our cell of interest has been labeled up with different types of dyes, one on the membrane, one in the nucleus, and then something else maybe looking at an organelle structure. So as we flow this labeled cell through the laser beam, through the flow cell, these dyes become excited. That information is then passed to the spectral decomposition units. And what happens is that each one of these mirrors then is responsible for transmitting or projecting a portion of the light onto each one of these camera channels. Now what happens is that each one of these camera channels is a CCD detector and the information from the cell is passed down at the same rate as the cell then moves down through the excitation. And at this stage, the information is being continuously integrated onto the camera. So again, this increases our sensitivity of measurement. So then at the end, as the cells move down and the information is integrated, what we end up with is a spatially registered output image of the cell. And this is an example of some data. So this is what we get out of it. Very, very powerful. Every single um, row here is an individual cell and every single column is an imaging feature or an imaging channel from the multispectral data that we've pulled out. So you can see that we have both transmitted light images and then targeted fluorescence, scatter image even, and we have all of this with literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cells. So we have the same scalability and throughput of conventional flow cytometry, but with the added extra of knowing exactly where those signals are in or on the cell. So how then do we analyze such incredibly rich data? Well, it's very much all about the fact that we're collecting digital imagery. So if we take a cell and we project it onto the CCD camera, as I'm doing here, the CCD camera is basically an array of pixels. And each one of these pixels is a detector, a photon counter. So these pixels therefore have X and Y coordinates. But of course, that's not the whole story. At every X and Y pixel coordinate, depending on the detector, depending on the dynamic range of the detector, there will be a numerical value associated with them. So in the case of the systems that we're describing here, they have a 12-bit CCD detector. Therefore, every pixel is digitized between on the range of 0 to 4096. So what this effectively does is that you don't just have your X and Y coordinate for a pixel, but you have a pseudo-intensity value at that position as well. So if we took this image here, and flipped it through this axis, 
this is what we would have. It would be like a mountain range, a textured mountain range of pixel values. And this is really the fundamental basis of what our data analysis is involved. So what we can we derive from a single digital image? So we're not even talking here about 12 digital images. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands of images. We're talking about just one. So from this spatially registered fluorescence image projected onto a CCD array, I can derive almost limitless numbers of features from it. So typically speaking, with conventional flow, we're obviously restricted to intensity-based measurements as we measure the area under the pulse curve. We can do similar things here. We can take all the pixel values above a certain threshold, sum them together, and plot the event as a single number. But then we have a limitless number of other intensity features that can be derived as well. But what really makes the difference here, of course, is that we can look at the shape of ourselves. There are a whole suite of features that can be derived uh, based on shape, such as circularity, elongatedness, perimeter. And because as well we have this, this, this lovely pixelized texture, we can also use that as a measurement too. We can look at how signals are modulated, we can look at texture features and that kind of thing. And then very importantly as well, we can use uh, the pixel information to look at locational stuff inside the cell. So we can ask the question, for example, is my receptor globally distributed around the cell? Is my transcription factor inside the nucleus? These are things, again, that we cannot do if we do not have an image. So why would you want to use imaging flow cytometry as opposed to a zero resolution cytometry technology? Well, I think really the two answers to that question are very straightforward. If you have a question that really does rely on knowing about cell morphology, having images are going to really help you answer that question. If you're interested, of course, as well, in the spatial context of a signal within the cell, again, imaging flow cytometry is your thing. And I guess if I was to add to either of these two, one other thing I might say is that if you have a very rare cell event or a very short-lived transitional state that would be very hard to find by something like manual microscopy, the ability to analyze hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of single cells quite rapidly will allow you to find enough of those events to be able to analyze them effectively. Okay, so now I want to move on to a, a worked example of some imaging flow cytometry data to try and give you an idea about how we interact with the data and what we can derive from it. So in this example, I thought I would show you is we're going to look at measuring uh, exosome uptake by murine T cells, again, using imaging flow cytometry. So what we want to do is we really want to be able to distinguish between these three different cellular states. So let's look at this first state here. Here we have a cell which is clearly not taking exosome onto its surface or inside of it, so it's negative. Then we have two examples of cells that have become associated with exosomes. Now, we don't need imagery to be able to distinguish between this cell state and these two. But if we also want to distinguish between cells that have the exosome on the surface and cells that have the exosome internalized, we need to have an image-based assay. So let's begin here. What we've done is we've acquired lots of data uh, on, a, on, a, on an imaging flow cytometer. And one of the first things we would do when we come to analyze the data is we'd want to basically eliminate events or cells from the file, from the data that we're not interested in. This is exactly what we would do with other forms of cytometry as well, and we tend to call this gating. So gating is where we take some kind of data plot and we make a, 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 a educated and controlled decision about the events or cells that we want to take forward for analysis and eliminate the events that we don't. So one of the first things we tend to do is we tend to make sure that we're eliminating any kind of debris from our data and also two cells or three cells or aggregates stuck together. So the way we do this is very powerful. We use the bright field, the transmitted image of the cell, and we simply use two very basic imaging-based metrics. One is the area, and the other one is basically a measure of circularity. Now, the beauty of this system is that every one of these dots in this measurement space is a cell, and we can check this by clicking on it and seeing the image of the cell. So what we've done here is we've identified uh, our objects or events with a particular area and a very high circularity as our single cells. So we gate on those, and then we eliminate our doublets and our aggregates. So now we take that population forward and we do a further uh, refining of it. We want to eliminate events that have been collected that are not in good focus. So in order to do this again, we go back to our bright field imagery. And what we do here is we use one of these texture features. And this texture feature is basically looking at the variation of the pixel values across an area of the object. 
And anything with a value uh, uh, higher than about maybe 50 units, we tend to score as being in good focus. And then values or cells that are below this threshold tend to be in very poor focus. Okay, so the third step of this analysis example I want to give you is where we take our single in-focus cells and we identify um, the cells within that population that are either positive or negative for the signal we're interested in looking at the spatial location of. So in this case, of course, it's the exosome signal. So our exosomes have been labeled with a particular dye, a fluorescent dye. And what we do here is we effectively treat our imaging data just like we would conventional flow cytometry data. We plot it in such a way that is akin to the pulse area, looking at the integrated fluorescence intensity, and we place, again, a region of interest or a gate on this uh, distribution to identify uh, cells that have become associated with an exosome signal uh, and distinguish the ones that have not. But then now, the next thing we want to do, of course, is we want to look at the spatial localization. This is the stage now where we really utilize our imagery to the full, and we want to identify the exosome positive events that either have the exosome on the majority on the outside of the cell versus the ones that have it on the inside. And the way we do this is a little bit more uh, complicated. Uh, it uses principles of, of, of classical image analysis, which are often called either masking or, or segmentation. So what I'm showing here in this, in this diagram is I'm showing one individual cell from our population that we've collected. I'm showing a couple of different multispectral images that we've got. Here's the bright field image. And here is an image of a membrane marker. And what I'm doing here is I'm then showing, overlaying over the image of the membrane marker, something called the mask. Now this mask is what the system, the software is using to define the pixels of interest. So hopefully you can see in this green overlay that the default mask is very generous and is encapsulating all of the cell. Now what we want to do is we want to measure how much of our exosome fluorescence resides inside the cell. So what we've done is we've modified the default mask to then only consider the area of the cell that is inside. And very simply what we do there is then we say, okay, please tell me what is the intensity of the signal here versus the entire cell. And of course, once we do this, we have the ability to plot this measurement for our whole cell population. And now we have a feature and a metric where we can distinguish between these two different states. So in this area here of our distribution of our cells, we have the majority of events which do not have the exosome internalized within the cell body. Whereas once we pass this threshold that we've set here, and again, just to mention, we've set this threshold using a control where we kept our samples at four degrees, so we would minimize or eliminate any exosome internalization. But what we can see now in this area of our plot is that we have the majority of cells which are internalized the exosome signal. And the beauty of this approach is that we can obviously then derive population-wide metrics that we can plot and analyze. And what I want to give you is the final kind of the prestige to this, this data analysis is, is, is what we actually derive from it. So what we have here is we have two different conditions. We have a, a wild type and, and, and a knockout condition. This is where uh, uh, the cells were lacking a particular key protein of interest. And what we find is, is quite interesting. If we treat our data in a non-image based way and simply ask what percentage of, of our cells in these two different genetic conditions have become associated with an exosome, we get one particular conclusion from the data. We would look and say that the knockout cells have more association. But if we use our imaging data and we look at the spatial localization of the signal, we get a very different picture. We actually find now that while one cell type has possibly bound more of them, it does not translate into an increased level of internalization. So again, what I want to kind of give you in this example is the, uh, the idea that if we don't have the spatial information, we could possibly come up with a conclusion that is wrong or only half the picture of the biology we're interested in. Okay, so I think this is a very important point. One of the last points I want to make in this section is that the beauty of image cytometry is that we are attempting to capture our data in a way which, again, is comparable, quantitative, and controlled. Now, this is very important when we draw conclusions from what our eye can interpret. And in this example I want to give you again, I want to give you, uh, uh, here is an image of a cell which 
is expressing again a fluorescently tag tagged um, transcription factor. And I think you know it's fair to say here that this is not a cell where the transcription factor seems to be within the nuclear area. But what we've done here, of course, is that we have made sure that we display the data that we've derived from our camera in an optimal fashion. So in this diagram here, what we're doing is we're basically showing how we scale the camera data on this axis on a 12-bit scale, how we scale that data to a visible display in 8 bits. And this is an optimal display setting. Because what we're doing is, in this green line, we're making the very best use of our available 8-bit display for the data that is actually contained in this image from the camera. If we draw a bisecting line through this image, you can see, of course, that the pixel values have this pattern. They start by being quite high as they go through this portion, then drop as they go through here, and then they come back up again as they go through the other part of the cytoplasm. Now what happens now if I take exactly the same cell and I change the way that I display it visually on an 8-bit scale? So what I've done here is again, I've taken the data from this image and I have altered the scaling so that now I have significantly gained up the display of the dimmer pixels so that visually this cell has changed, but it's the same cell. And I think what I want to stress here is that the way we display our data can influence the way that we would interpret it without a numerical value behind it. Again, if we take a measurement tool and bisect through this image, it's the same image, you can see hopefully that the pattern of pixels is identical here and here. So while we've changed the display of the data, we have not changed the data that came from the 12-bit CCD camera. And importantly, when we make our measurement on this cell of our feature, which again is derived from the camera values, it's identical. So no matter how we present this image, the data underlying it, because it's an image cytometry experiment, doesn't change. So to kind of conclude on this part, it's very important to say image cytometry should eliminate the possibility to manipulate image interpretation through display. It's very important though that we pay more attention to the numbers and in some cases less to the images. And with great images comes great responsibility. So again, it's very important also to focus on those numbers too. Okay, so what does the future hold for imaging flow cytometry? It's a very exciting area at the moment. Again, as I record this seminar, there have been two very big advancements in the field. The first one comes from uh, a group um, led by, um, or the first author is um, Sado Ota. This work was published in Science in 2018. It's called Ghost Cytometry. And again, at this point, I'd like to make another reference to an iBiology seminar by Stefan Schmidt on cell sorting. And again, just briefly, cell sorting is, a, is a, a, an area of, of cytometry where we don't just measure our cell heterogeneity, we actually can physically separate our cells based on that heterogeneity profile. Uh, until recently, this could only be done using zero-resolution conventional fluorescence flow cytometry. But this group here in, 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 in Japan have developed a, an approach which allows us to sort our cells based on an image. So what happens here is that you have your cells again being introduced into a, into a sheath stream. You have a, a measurement here using a PMT, but the way they've done it is that they've set the PMTs up now where we do get some kind of morphological and spatial information. And the important thing here is now you can select cells not just on what they express and what level they express, but actually how they look and where that signal is within the cell. And then another group as well, last year publishing in Cell, Neonatus group, um, they also developed another approach for doing uh, pretty much exactly the same thing, where you can take cells, you can image them, you can then put it through an intelligent deep learning network, and you can formulate a very rapid sort decision, which then allows us to physically isolate and separate cells of a particular morphology or spatial localization. So to give a final summary, there are definitely certain experimental questions that absolutely require imagery. Imaging flow cytometry, though, is essentially, in essence, very similar to our zero-resolution flow cytometry in how the cells are processed, how they're stained, and how the measurement occurs using lasers and fluorescence. But, of course, our output is a spatially registered image. And one of the challenges, really, with this kind of output is image analysis makes it very difficult. Uh, the measurements are not just based on our total intensity, 
<clears throat> and as such, they can be almost infinite. So one of the challenges we find, of course, is then how do you select the best feature or the best parameter to be able to resolve two cell populations from one another? But imaging cytometry or imaging flow cytometry is a very, very powerful discipline that will only become more important to cytometry-based research and all other fields of cell biology, particularly now as we move into the, uh, the dawn of imaging sorting. Okay, so I'd just like to finish by uh, acknowledging my, my team and also uh, my collaborator who worked with me on the uh, exosome work. Thank you very much for listening.